Okay, so we'll begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your mercy and love towards us. And we ask your presence to be with us in this year meeting. Help me to present this year study in a manner that is uh, <coughs> that your people can understand and that I can uh, be clear and uh, in a sense um, present it in a way that's uh, to your honour and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, my, my study is called The Bible Based Chronological Study with a focus on the book of Judges. And my previous presentation, I entitled it Approaching the Chronology of Chronologies and had the idea that Usher was like a step of, of uh, development in chronology. His was generally the most detailed chronology up to that their time. And he established some dates that William Miller would then use that would bring him uh, to present the 2,300 years and enable a people to, go, to enter into the holy place in heaven by faith. So, so in a sense, there Miller, I, I said that he was his chronology was like uh, the, the chronology for the the holy place. But uh, after 1863, we had a rejection of the 2520. We had Edmund Fields chronology, which. Uh, is, is going to be damaging for us to understand the chronology of the Bible properly. And he has been criticized by many others. I, I think uh, Nolan Floyd Jones, he's a Baptist chronologist. <coughs> so he, Floyd Nolan Jones. Floyd, okay, Floyd Nolan Jones, he uh, is quite critical of him as well. And when I was sort of researching, before doing these presentations, um, you do get lots of different ideas. People who say, well, I'm going to stick with the Bible. This is the chronology that we're given, and we should be circumspect and detailed and specific and focused and whatever. And then they would take something like the 40 years of Saul and say, it doesn't, that was a, an error, and they would do their chronology different and things like that. So, and there's a, uh, a whole lot of chronology, but they don't have the chronology um, that I, I believe that as God is revealing to us a chronology which is, is just more detailed. It's, it's really, as we approach the end of the world, we're getting more and more information. And we're seeing a lot of these here structures which are helping uh, to confirm this chronology. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Usher had uh, produced the dates that Muller had uh, used, like 742 or 6, 677. And during that, the time of 1798 to 1844, there had been a great increase in chronology understanding. And uh, part of this year, my presentations will eventually focus on judges. Uh, but we've seen that the, the vagueness of judges, uh, there's a misunderstanding of it, enabled William Miller then to have a 6,000 year history that ended in 1844. Uh, we know that was wrong, but I believe that God had his hand in these, through these mistakes that he was going to be using. These here mistakes in chronology, um, eventually they would be refined. And as we come to now our time, uh, a lot of these here mistakes we're beginning to understand and we're resolving them. Um, so, I mentioned sort of like various chronologies in the past. Uh, Eusebius, 
and bead and so forth. And um, they were focusing the end of the 6,000 years, particularly Eusebius, around the year 1800, or around the year 800, would have been like the, the end of the world almost uh, for a lot of people approaching that at their time, but Bede, his chronology sort of changed that. And um, I had a comment from Heidi, she mentioned about me adding more diagrams. So I had mentioned just briefly a few things I mentioned about this year movement and some of the, the things which we have uh, uncovered. And I just had them listed there, I didn't go into any detail. But I'll just, I'm not going to do a lot of detail, but I'll just bring up the diagrams that relate to them. And one of them here is, um, I have a wee light pen. So one of them I mentioned is this one here. So Joseph and Christ, 21798, chronological parallel. So we have uh, Joseph born 30 years, Christ, he's uh, going to be 30 years old when he's baptized, and Joseph is going to be made uh, second in command to Pharaoh. And then you have seven years of plenty, and this parallels the last week of Christ from 27 AD to the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD, so that's the, the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9. And then we have a famine begin, which parallels that stoning of Stephen. And there's going to be seven years of famine. And it's going to be divided into two years and five years when Jacob joins Joseph. And this parallels a period of two times 252 years to when the papal supremacy begins in 538. And then you have five times 252 years to when the Pope is taken captive in 1798. So just explaining that. Uh, the next one is concerning the, the two Lamechs that I have mentioned there. So uh, there's, this is the 70 week prophecy from 457 to 34 AD. And it's divided into a 49 year period, which is a Jubilee year. We have then uh, 62 weeks, which is uh, 434 years. And that takes us to the final sabbatical week of seven years. And I believe it is Theodore who um, recognized that when you multiply 49 uh, by seven, so connecting this here sabbatical cycle with the, sorry, the, the Jubilee cycle with the sabbatical cycle, it gives us the number 343. And we add that together, it gets us the number 777, adding that with the 434 years. And this here period of, uh, creates to 777, which connects to the Lamech of um, Genesis 531. It says there, and all the days of Lamech shall be uh, sorry, were 777 years and he died. But these here, 490 years, connects us to the other Lamech of Genesis chapter 4, verse 24, uh, where it says, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech 77fold. And if we connect the 777 years from when the, the 490 years begin, it takes us to 321, where we have the, the Sunday Law of Constantine. And in, in 34 AD, the, the 490 years takes us to the close of probation for ancient Israel. However, the Sunday Law is the first uh, Sunday Law which typifies the last Sunday Law being the close of probation for the world. And now we have a, a, a statement by Ellen White there. She says, the first public measure Enforcing Sunday observance was a law enacted by Constantine, AD 321. This edict required townspeople to rest on the venerable day of the sun, but permitted countrymen to continue their agricultural pursuits. Though virtually a heathen statute, it was enforced by the emperor after his nominal acceptance of Christianity. So that's from the Great Controversy, uh, page 
574. And uh, we mentioned the four uh, seven times of Leviticus uh, 26 in the list there. And this is uh, a work that Theodore had done. He recognized from the, the captivity of Manasseh, beginning of the 2520 there, there were 70 years to the Babylonian uh, captivity. And this is connected to the first seven times that we read there in, I think it's in verse 18 of Leviticus 26. And then the second, second uh, seven times in verse 21 of Leviticus 26 uh, relates us uh, to the time when Daniel's taken captive, the 70 years there. And then Jehoiachin uh, applies to the third seven times in verse 24. And that's two times, 200, two times 70 years it takes us to the decree of Artaxerxes. And then the four seven times in verse 28 uh, applies to the 70 years from when the temple was destroyed to the decree of, Artax of Darius in 516 BC and the building of the second, um, the second temple. And we also mentioned... Um, just a I, I just noticed something. So I took those verses, mm -hmm. 18, 21, 24, and 28, multiplied them together, and I got a big number. And what I did is I divided that number by the number of uh, minutes in a day, and the number I get is 176.4. So you, you multiplied 18? 18 by 21. So 18 times 21 times 24 times 28. Equals? Uh, 254. Zero one. 016. Mm -hmm. And then I divided it by, I could have just divided by 144, right? But I divided by 1440 just looking at the number of minutes in a day. And I get... 176.4, and that's that number that you didn't mention when you were dealing with the story of Joseph, the 1,764 years that you told me to, but well, we counted. If you count from 34 AD to 1798, it's 1,764 years, mm -hmm. which is um, 504 plus 1260. That's the 2 times 252 plus the 5 times 252, so it's 7 times 252. And then we counted back from 34 A.D. to when Jacob blesses his 12 sons. Okay, so I mentioned there the four seven times. No, it's mentioned there four times. So we understand that the seven times is 2520. Mm -hmm. So if you had, so I want you to multiply it by um, the four, 2520 times four, which is 10,080. So, so I multiply which by 25 times? The, uh, the multiplying of the 18, 21, and 24, and 28. Okay, 18 times, so 18 times 21 times 24 times 28. Yeah, and I do what with it? You multiply it by the, the 4, 7 times, so 25, 20 times 4. So you get as 10,000 and 80. Okay. Yeah. And then we get two seven four three three seven two eight zero. You sure? Um yeah, but does anyone else get Did that? you add it or or multiply it? So what do you have? You divide divide. Oh divide it by that. Yes. Okay, you said multiply. Sorry about <laughs> divide. Yeah, well, I understand that will work out because. Really, yes. Um, yeah, so that, and now that number, of course, uh, um, I got 235.2, is that right? <laughs> I get something different. Okay, is, I'm doing 18 times 21 times 24, 24 times um, 28. Yeah, okay, and it divided by 1,080. Uh, 10,080. Oh, 10,000. So. 
and 80. There we go. Yeah, then you get 25.2. Yeah, so. so but yeah, so it's like a, a thousandth of a 25.20. Yeah. So it's sort of. Yeah, so both calculations are actually valid and related to each other as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned that sort of like what Dwight had said concerning the repeat of Millerite history. You have 457 uh, aligned with 1844, so we've covered that. And mentioned the pattern of Christ, where Christ is 34 years in preparation. He's 1260 days ministry, then he has a death, resurrection, and ascension. Um, with uh, paganism being taken away in 508, we've 30 years of preparation. That's uh, part of the 1290 of um, add it to the 1260 that we find in Daniel 12, verse 11. And then you have the papal supremacy, which is 1260 years. And then he has a death in 1798, the deadly wound. And we can expect his resurrection at the Sunday law. And I've applied his ascension to the Sunday law worldwide. Now it's... Um, there's some logic there. Um. Yeah, this was interesting because the first president, the first series I went to in Oklahoma, there was something similar that Jeff presented, this parallel. Mm -hmm. um, though there were some other things added to it, uh, which I can't remember. And I don't know if I have that presentation, a copy of it. He added Revelation chapter 11 about the two witnesses. They also have a death. They're, they're um, laying, laid in the street, slain in the street okay. for 1260 days or years, I think it says something yeah, there. Yeah, because I only saw the presentation once and I knew very little And then about they stand the on their feet. Yeah. And then they ascend it and all behold. So mm -hmm. you have. A repeat there. You do, might not have the 30 years, but you have all the other. Mm -hmm. You have the 1260, the death, resurrection, and ascension. So, um, we've covered that. So, just an example of the increase of knowledge that we have uh, experienced. Uh, concerning chronology, as we approach the end of all things. So, I want to have this here sort of um, presentation. Of, uh, this is like a, war, a wide angle view. So we're like we're zooming out. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, the chronology that we're now understanding that's been revealed, and sort of giving the logic for the dates we're, 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 uh, we've. We've come to understand uh, and to the applying them to the events, and then um, sort of uh, just where that leads. So the imagery of Ezekiel chapter one, uh, I just want to talk about that. Um, we know this takes place on the fifth day of the fourth month, which is mid midnight in middle right history, and it was July. 21 actually in the Julian calendar in 592 BC. So there's a, very much a connection with Ezekiel and what we've been uh, on learning at the end of the world. Um, in chapter 1, uh, verses 3, 6, and 10, it says, The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And everyone had the face and everyone had four faces and four wings. As for their likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion, and on the right side, and they and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. So uh, there's reasonable conjecture, I believe, that these animals represent the sky, or more specifically, the 12 constellations <coughs> through which the sun yearly passes, um, known as the zodiac. 
So Ezekiel soon after describes the likeness of the firmament, um, so the, the, the air, the space, uh, stretched over their heads above, and above the firmament, the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. So sapphire is color blue, as the color of the sky is. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. So this would appear to be picture language of God above the sky, controlling the heavens with its constellations. Heathen nations and even Israel had burned incense to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. So we get that in 2 Kings chapter 23. Rather than the one who has set his glory above the heavens, as uh, a reference to Psalms 8 verse 1, Thus the symbolism could be seen as a rebuke to those who worship the creation rather than the creator. And if we have the lion uh, being symbolic of Leo, um, Taurus is an ox, so we can... I was just having some presentations. Okay, thanks. So, um, <coughs> the ox we can relate uh, to Taurus and to, uh, to the man we can relate to the, the water bearer, which is normally associated with a man carrying water. And then the eagle we can relate that to Scorpio. So Scorpio has three different animals, the scorpion, the snake, and the eagle. So that's from uh, Wikipedia. So there's other animals associated with that. It may have been in the past, that constellation. It could have been related as the snake or the eagle. Um, and these here constellations uh, can be found on the per per perpendicular and therefore represent the whole uh, constellations. So, I was just uh, noting that. So, it says in Psalm 147, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his understanding is infinite. So there we see God calls the stars, he's given them names. So it may be that the current names of the constellations had some divine origin, in observing uh, that the sun passes through the constellation of Virgo around the time of the autumn equinox, and that this year time corresponds to with the birth of Christ to a virgin, uh, would lead, lend credence to at least some of their names having a divine endorsement. So Christ was crucified about the time of the spring equinox, so therefore uh, either side of that uh, being three and a half years within a seven year um, yeah, seven year period, so therefore that 1260 or three and a half years prior to that would take him to the autumn of uh, AD 27. Okay, just, just a comment about um, <clears throat> divine endorsement. I don't know if we need divine endorsement, but God recognizes what man has done. And if we look at the idea that uh, the Babylonians and then the Jews worshiped the sky, uh, God is just using that information Mm -hmm. and speaking against it, showing that he's in control of the heavens. So the names, people could have chosen anything, and God would have utilized that, just like he did with all of the calendars. So it doesn't mean, like, because we use the Gregorian calendar, it has divine endorsement, but God recognizes it and uses it as, as a testimony against the papacy, and same with the Roman pagan calendar, the Julian, and same with the Islamic calendar for Islam, etc., so all of these things have uh, God, it shows that God ultimately is in control and has taken all these things into consideration uh, mm -hmm. before the creation of the world. Okay, thank you. So Ellen White, she quotes um, the Bible here, says, the Lord Jesus is acquainted with the number of the stars. He calls them by their names, finds the sweet influence of Pleiades, and looses the bands of Orion. The ministers of the gospel of Christ are greater blessings to the church than are the stars to our world. 
All are in God's hand. He directs their motions. He disposes of them in their different orbs, in their positions. He fills them with light and influence. He supports them, else they would be falling stars. They are instruments in his hands, and all the good they do is done by the hand and by the Spirit's power. Um, she also, also here is Amos 5, verse 7, says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into morning, and maketh the day dark with night, and calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So the seven stars there mentioned, we can relate that to the Pleiades. I think it's actually the same word in the Hebrew. And it mentions Orion again. So here we have the constellations that we are currently familiar with. And there's a certainly, as you say, maybe not an endorsement, but a recognition for these here names. And then we know that uh, Ellen White comments on Orion. She says in the... She says in the Great Controversy, but this is Review and Herald. So there is a divine, oh, sorry, this is me actually speaking until it says, I say recognition here. So there is a divine recognition for the names we use today, for the constellations, even if they may not have been originally so called by God. The balance here would refer to the three main stars of Orion's belt. The loosening relate to the approach of Christ to the earth at the second coming and the descent of the New Jerusalem after the millennium. Uh, so Elmite says, dark heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up, then we looked up through the open space in Orion from whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. So this is in reference to just before the second coming of Christ, we see Orion being mentioned and I had the idea there, loosing the bands of Orion. It's, uh, you have three stars in that belt. And I was thinking of the three angels' messages because stars, there's a relation to uh, angels, two stars. Uh, we have the angels when the, uh, the star in the sky, that the, the Magi seen were uh, angels, they all might say so. And there's uh, seven in Revelation chapter one, I think it's uh, Christ has seven, seven stars in his hand, and the seven stars are seven angels. So, therefore, if there's going to be three stars in the belt of Orion, it's going to be loosed. We can maybe see there an application to the three angels' messages. So, um, Moving on to an attested date from which to springboard from. So the idea here is there's a date in the Bible that we have very authenticated uh, proof. Um, with that there date, we can then use other uh, chronological information that we find in the Bible to then find other dates. And uh, this here is going to take us back to finding when creation began. So that particular date is the 16th of March, 597 BC. Now this is uh, since referenced by Ezekiel. He says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Tibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. So the reference there I'm picking up is the, the captivity of Jehoiachin. So the fifth year uh, began, so Jehoiachin, he um, reigned three months and 10 days. We get that from two Chronicles, chapter 36, verse nine. Jehoiachin was eight years old when he began to reign and he reigned three months and 10 days in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So approximately about 100 days. And then there's a clay tablet called ABC 5 Jerusalem Chronicle of the Babylonian Chronicles, which establishes that Jehoiachin was captured on the second day of the month, Adaru or Adar, 
which is the 12th month and equates to the 16th of March, 597 BC. And then thereafter, the king of Babylon made Mataniah his father, his father's brother, or his uncle, in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So this chronicle states, in the seventh year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, so that's 598 to 597 BC, the month of Kislimu, the king of Akkad mustered his troops and marched to the Hatti land, which is another name for Judah, and besieged the city of Judah. And on the second day of the month of Adaru, he seized the city and captured the king. He appointed there a king of his own choice, received its heavy tribute and sent to Babylon. Yeah. So just an interesting point about here. So you can see the month Kislimu, that's um, the ninth month, Kislev, mm -hmm. right, so in, in Hebrew. And, and so you see it, it takes time for him to travel. And the Hattie land refers to the Levant or Palestine, so that whole area there from the Mediterranean uh, to um, uh, Sorry, the Euphrates, yeah. right? Okay. So that, that's, so it talks about the Hattie land in these Assyrian documents, that's what they're referring to. And Judah, of course, is in the Hattie land. Okay, thank you. So this is a Babylonian chronicle calculator or converter. And uh, you can go on online and you can find there on the 16th of March. Now that's uh, the Gregorian date, this is the Julian date. You can find out that the second day of Adaru and the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar that was indeed the 16th of March. Then it says, And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother, and his servants, and his princes, and his officers, and the king of Babylon, and took him in the eighth year of his reign. So therefore we have evidence to pin down the exact date and day of that event. So a note. So a note both, it says the eighth year that he took him. So we can see it's the end of his seventh year mm -hmm. is the twelfth month, right? The uh, the second day of the twelfth month, right? Mm -hmm. March 16th. Uh, but just because that's the day he's, uh, that's the days that the walls of Jerusalem then are, that's when the siege ends, but still he's not going to take him there that day. So it's going to be in the eighth year, and it's going to be in the eighth year that he takes Mataniah and make some kings. So that means as Zedekiah, Zedekiah is going to become king after the spring, right? Yes. So this is a... It's a technical point. It's a, it's a technical point. And when you re read uh, Wikipedia for the destruction of Jerusalem, sometimes it will give a date, 587. And it's all based upon when Zedekiah came to the throne. Was it uh, Zedekiah's eighth year? Or sorry, not was Nebuchadnezzar's eighth year or the seventh year. So Jeremiah 52 verse 28 says, uh, could be seen as supportive of Joachim becoming captive in the seventh year. Um, so we had there mentioned there in the eighth year that he's taken to Babylon, but he's, he's taken actually captive by Nebuchadnezzar in the seventh year. Uh, so this kind of supports this uh, seventh year says, this is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,000 Jews and 23 and 20. So there's 3,023 people taken captive in the seventh year. And I believe that would, you can maybe connect that to um, Jehoiachin's captivity, although maybe there's uh, Jehoiakim. There was a captivity maybe taken there. Now, he was slain, I believe, outside the walls. He wasn't taken captive. He was just killed outside the walls of Jerusalem. It says he was, had a burial of an ass. So I'm not too sure if there's much yeah. of captivity taken there. Yeah, so the idea is that, because um, uh, I've, I've, I've struggled with this point because there's different opinions, but it seems that uh, Jehoiakim uh, 
because the Babylonians had a protection racket. So they come to Jerusalem, Jehoiakim went out, and then he would have been taken captured or taken captive and then killed. And uh, and then we're going to see that Jehoiachin is then placed upon the throne. That begins the period of the siege. And then that lasts for three months and ten days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if it's going to be the 16th of March, well, that's uh, the second month, second day of the 12th month. So Jehoiachin is taken captive. Now you have only another say, 28 days maybe, before you enter. So this is the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar. So another 28 days after that, it's going to be the, the, uh, the eighth. Oh. The eighth year. And so it's likely that uh, Jehoiachin then stayed in Jerusalem until the eighth year, and then he was taken to captive uh, to Babylon, and then Zedekiah would have been made king in the eighth year. So I think that's roughly what we're saying. Uh, So some chronologists there, as I said, Wikipedia, for instance, uh, has Zedekiah's reign uh, began in the spring of 597 BC. Uh, I suppose that it is in the spring, but it's in the... Before the beginning of the year. Before the beginning of the year. Uh, So that would be... well, 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 we're saying that he began after the beginning of the year, but some say it's before. And there's some bit technical uh, concerning this. Uh, so that would be, a con- there would be a consequence to this that would place the destruction of Jerusalem in 587, and consequently would make the journey of the escapee from Jerusalem to Ezekiel over a year and five months to complete. So this is unlikely, as Ezra had taken about four months. However, a note on the autumn, a full, the full count uh, for Jehoiachin's reign would make the escapee's journey about five months. So that would be a more credible on time scale. And then we have uh, another consequence of reckoning Jehoiachin's uh, reign spring to spring is that the siege of Jerusalem would have lasted about two and a half years rather than about one and a half. So this is a bit of a sort of, <laughs> I'm trying to just explain it briefly. So here we have our years, so that would be January here, and that would be December, and this is the year 588, this is the year 587, and the five year 586. Now, if the siege began in the ninth year of Jehoiachin here, and uh, so that was, if it was like a spring to spring count for Zedekiah and Jehoiachin. So that would be when the siege begins of Jerusalem. And then you'd have a period of one year, six months, and 12 days to when the walls were broken down. That would occur in the 11th year of Zedekiah. However, it's not until the 12th year of Jehoiachin in the fifth day of the tenth month. So that would, that would be his, his twelfth year, and the fifth day of the tenth month. So that would be a journey of the escapee of one year, five months, and twelve days, which would be unlikely to be taken that, that long. However, if you have um, Jehoiachin's reign here, having a well, so this would be Zedekiah's reign, ninth year, but you would have Jehoiachin's uh, tenth year here. So Jehoiachin would be autumn to autumn, and this would be spring to spring count for Zedekiah. You would have then this, the siege of Jerusalem uh, begin in uh, January 587. Then it would be 559 days to when the walls are broken down. And then you would have the... Uh, the skip E then in the 12th year, and this would be the correct here. So that would make the time limit about just, uh, just over five months uh, for the skip E. So that would be a... Go ahead. 
Yeah, so to explain this for people who are watching, if you look at um, Ezekiel chapter 24, when the siege begins, um, Ezekiel is told that it begins. He says, mark this day, even this day. Write down this day, even this day. And he had been predicting the siege. But he's told by God that this somebody's going to come and tell him about the destruction. So he knows about the siege only directly from God. But the escapee is going to be the first person who actually tells him about the destruction. So that he's going to receive by an eyewitness. And there's no way that he would have heard that a year and a half later. The, the first eyewitness would have... The first, basically, it's the first report yes. that he has that Jerusalem mm -hmm. had been destroyed. Yes, so thank you for that point. So, with the kings of Judah coming to their end in the summer of 586, there exists two witnesses to establish when they began. One is from an accumulated account of the reigns that were given of them. Um, so accumulated account of the reigns of the kings that, were, that we are given. And the others from the 390 years of Ezekiel, chapter 4, verse 5. So the periods of the kings of Judah from Rehoboam to the captivity of Zedekiah by Babylon uh, is a period of 391 years and about six months. When we total up the years given in the scripture, it comes to 393 years and six months. However, there is a, a two-year co-regency which needs to be considered. So this is, uh, I couldn't really, it's quite small for <laughs> fully get in, but there I have all the reigns of the kings of Judah. This is the, the time that they reigned. And I've counted up, just totaled up, tallied up uh, these here reigns. Um, it comes to, when you get to Zedekiah, it uh, comes to 393 uh, years and six months. And this year, two-year co-regency then, we can be seen uh, when we look at Jehoshaphat, 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 when he begins to reign. So it's 18 years when... Uh, in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, when Joram, he's the king of northern Israel, he begins to reign. And then it's going to be five years to when Jehoram begins to reign. So he's the son of Jehoshaphat. So that would make it, bring it into the 23rd year of Jehoshaphat. Now Jehoshaphat, he dies after reigning 25 years. So there's going to be just uh, an extra two years when Jehoram and Jehoshaphat co-reign. Um, I've just added there the verses below that sort of uh, relate to this year diagram. So that's 391 years and six months for the reign of the kings. We can take out from um, 586 BC and count back. We also have these 390 years in Ezekiel. He's prophesying the siege. And that siege is going to last a year and a half. And from that siege, if you count back, so that siege is going to occur in the year 587 in January, which we had looked at in that sort of previous diagram. And you count back 390. It's going to take us to the year... 977, and then you got a year, a siege of 18 months or one and a half years, 1.5 years, and that's going to correlate with the number of the reigns of the kings. So we have this here date 977, and this is going to take us back to when uh, the kingdom was divided after Saul, Solomon had died. We had Rehoboam begin to reign on, in the south. Well, he, had, he was ready reigning, and then uh, Jeroboam begins to reign in the northern ten tribes of Israel. Then we can launch from 977, uh, from this year date. Usher actually gets, puts it at 975. 
but uh, we have what I believe God is leading, in a, leading us to a correct chronology. So from this year date, we can mark the 120 years period when the kings of the United Kingdom, namely Saul, David and Solomon, who each ruled 40 years. So uh, there's some uh, references there. Uh, in Acts 13, 21, we get where Saul reigned for 40 years. Uh, 2 Samuel 5, verse 4 is where David reigns for 40 years. And then 1 Kings 11, verse 42, we have there where uh, Solomon reigns for 40 years. So 120 years, add it to 977, takes us to 1097 BC. And we can reckon from that their date, that would be the end of the judges and the anointing of Saul by Samuel. So we'll be uh, relating to the, the chronology of the judges later on in more detail. But there we, we see when they, the judges end in, in 1097 BC. We have also another chronological date in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. So we have here Solomon's fourth year. We already seen there that Saul reigned 40 years and David reigned 40 years. And here we have Saul, Solomon's uh, this year temple reigning uh, in his fourth year of his reign. So we add that the 40 plus the 40 plus the 4 gives us 84. And we're told this is a, a period of 480 years to when, till after the children of Israel will come out of the land of Egypt. So part of that 480 is going to be these here 84 years of the kings. And then we're going to have a period of um, so you take 480, it would be 396 years left um, to, to assign when uh, the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. So that's going to be including the period of the judges. But we have to pin down whereabouts uh, this year is it referring to. Is it referring to the Exodus? Or is it referring to when they entered Canaan? And my understanding is it is referring to when they entered Canaan. So this would be different from Usher. He would take this here to be applying to the Exodus. And therefore, he would have the period of the judges being a period of 356 years. Because um, within that, 300, he's going to count 396 years, but you're going to have the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness as part of that. So Usher is going to see this here, 84. And then he's going to have the judges be in a period of 356. And then you're going to have 40 years when they're in the wilderness. And this would be the Exodus. And this is the period of 480 years, as uh, he understands it. So. Um, now, we'll have to look at some evidence of why I'm going to contend that this is wrong and why it's actually referring to the time when they entered into Canaan. So, so one of the, the evidences I have here is uh, supported from Psalm 114, verses 1 to 5. It says, when Israel went out of Egypt, so there, if we look at First Kings, it mentions there, uh, when the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, okay? So it connects with that. It says, the house of Israel, the, sorry, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, Judah was his sanctuary, and Israel his dominion. The sea sought and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like lambs, and the little hills like lambs. What aileth thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Thou Jordan, that thou was driven back. 
So there we see the Jordan uh, being mentioned in connection of when Israel went out of Egypt. Now it also says the sea saw it and fled, could be referring to the Red Sea as well. And here we have the Jordan being driven back. So my contention in, in this here verse is that coming out of Egypt is a period of 40 years. Um, it's not just one event at the Exodus, uh, but it's also including this here crossing of the River Jordan. And um, it's distinct by two periods when, or two events involving the driving back of waters. Another witness is Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 36. It says, As I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. So, one commentator, this is um, Gill, um, John Gill. John Gill. Uh, so he's like in the 1600s. He says, This refers to the controversy the Lord had with the Israelites for murmuring upon the report of the spies, and the sentence be passed upon them that they should not enter into the land of Canaan, but their carcasses should fall in the wilderness. So that's that pleading with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So here we see this is uh, after they've came out of Egypt, they've um, been to Mount Sinai, they've heard the law, they've left Mount Sinai to enter the promised land, the spies go in, and then there's this here uh, controversy with the spies. They're not believing Joshua and Caleb, and uh, this is this here is and this is referring to happening in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So there we have they're still in a sense in Egypt. They've left, came out of Egypt in a sense. Uh, by crossing the Red Sea, but they're in the, still in a sense within the land of Egypt. And it's only when they cross uh, the Jordan River that they will then uh, fully come out of Egypt. So time-wise, are we? One minute. Yeah. So just a comment. Um, so this is the main difference between our chronology and Usher's. And yes. it was not easy to, to disagree with Usher on this point. But there was a lot of factors that led to it. And mm -hmm. one of them had to do with just the year of the exodus in relationship to the weekly cycle. And, uh, and we're not going to go into that at this point. But we had so many different witnesses that we had to accept this idea that the 480th year is counting not from the crossing of the Red Sea, but from the crossing of the Jordan. And so that mm -hmm. lengthens our chronology from ushers, ushers from that point on, uh, from creation mm -hmm. to that point of, uh, it's 40 years longer, right? Now, there's a few other things. Remember, Usher never had uh, the Babylonian Chronicles to nailed down the exact year for the destruction of Jerusalem. He had it in 588. Um, and there's other places here and there where he had to sort of, it's like using a yardstick that doesn't have inches on it, and you're trying to make a precise measurement. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so there are a couple of years here and there, they shift back and forth. But our, our chronology, for the most part, is very similar to Usher's, except on this one point. And it was a huge revelation. So that 1,764 years uh, that we counted back from 34 AD uh, to um, 1731 BC when Jacob is going to bless his 12 sons, if we had Usher's chronology, we would not have that. Mm -hmm. And so I know this is your main point, is that this is the chronology of chronologies, that we're working towards that, that God continues to give us light, and this light continues to bring forth all kinds of mm -hmm. structures and things that could never have been seen if we hadn't done this work on chronology. And these are witnesses of the truth mm -hmm. of Adventism. So for Seventh-day Adventists who um, have problems with the 2300 days and, and other prophecies in the Bible and are questioning whether 
Adventism is true because their pastor says there's no support for any of these dates, uh, then this is a strong witness against those attacks on Adventism. And I believe that's the primary reason that they were given. But they also relate to our movement as well. Mm -hmm. I also had to struggle with this here understanding of the coming out of Egypt as applying to when they crossed the Jordan because there's a lot of references there that would seem to support yes this is obviously the exodus it just seems plain um, but when you have it at the the, uh, the crossing of the Jordan there's just such so many chronological other F witnesses come to this here there's just there's just uh, structures that emerge that you would not see, and uh, we'll hopefully get to them uh, tomorrow. Uh, but uh, we'll just leave it today, we'll, and we'll address what you said there about that particular day, the manna falls, and so forth, how that relates to evidence for um, 1533 and so forth uh, when we get there. So we'll close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we again give thanks for your mercy to us and your love and uh, give thanks for what you're revealing to us uh, concerning the chronology. May we be uh, witnesses um, for this year to convince others. May we do it in a manner which is to your glory. And uh, we ask you to be with Theodore as he leads out in the next presentation. And may those who are listening be blessed and um, have a, a closer relationship with you through these year studies. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.